Hello, hello, it's John Mark W. And you're with the word again. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Whatever time it is where you are listening, wherever you are listening from, we thank you so much for tuning in. And this is Genesis 22 uh, analysis. So we're going to read read it one time through, and then we're going to go back and then get into the nitty-gritty analysis of the word as we read it uh, again. And I do start my videos out with the intro, which is what you're listening right now. And you guys know how it goes. If you've been listening to my other video, there have been many lores, many stories, uh, many writings, um, many um, um, many, many writings, uh, many all kinds of different lores and different things like that. And they have been great. Some are awesome stories and awesome, and they have awesome moral representations of how real life, of how things play out. Like Lord of the Rings, like George Lucas's Star Wars, like uh, other types of movies, right? You know, they have a morality to them. It, it's, it's poetic justice. It's almost like, you know, it's, it's just really, really, really good to see these stories. You guys know the stories. Some of us rem remember these stories. There have even been awesome video games that have come out over the many, many, many years. Okay, then you have those other stories. Uh, these are the newer ones where there's really not morality to it. There is just, everything is just kind of morally gray. There is no right. There is no wrong. The morality is blurred. Uh, the, now people are making things nowadays where the genders are blurred. Uh, there's there's gender blending going on, social justice warriors, the feminist movement, um, and uh, f feminism. In, 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 in it's just it's very all really really toxic and detrimental for sales in video games in business. Uh, these people they just get off on ruining things. I guess they feel that. Their life sucks, so they got to make other people's life suck too. And yeah, that's a part of the evil agenda and a part of the big picture of what the devil's trying to do worldwide to everything. And um, anyways, there are these lures and these stories that that just totally are untrue. And oh, well, they're obviously untrue. They're fictitious, right? which all these stories are, but the truth of morality is not even in it, which is why I don't even like it. I just don't even get into that. It's hard for me to like something that has no morals and just is just crazy. You know what I'm saying? Insanity that's being marketed. And, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And these people think that they're doing something new but they're really doing the same insane stuff that the devil's been selling people and giving to people. He's been giving people the same old fried ice cream for years. But because they don't know the truth, they can't tell the difference between the truth and what's false. Between what's right and what's wrong. Between um, clarity and insanity. And so... We know the Bible is real, 100%, unlike these other things. And it actually has truth in it. Things that really happen, things that God has said. There's scientific evidence and facts from this Bible that people did not discover any other way unless it was from this Bible or from the Jewish people because the Jewish people had already knew a lot of these things before the world finally caught up. You know what I'm saying? You had the Jewish people, which were God set apart people, which we're reading about the beginning of that in Genesis right now with the father of the faithful, Abraham, and you're seeing why he's called the father of the faithful and why God chose him, you know, to come out of his homeland, which was originally the land of the Chaldeans, the land of Ur. And, um... The Bible is true, unlike those fictitious stories. And that's why I'm sharing that now, because I look at a lot of YouTube videos um, when I have the time. And, you know, I've had a lot of time now. And I look at how other people are so fascinated and really get into this lore of whatever they're talking about. And that's really cool to see that. But it's not real. 
it's not going to save them from their sin. It's just for entertainment purposes. And it's, you know, not even going to make us any money and help us to pay our bills. But we like talking about it. Well, depending on if you're a content creator and you got a contract going on and you have supporters, yeah, it may actually pay your bills to talk about these fictitious things. <laughs> but, you know, just seeing them get into that, it's really cool to see that. But it's at the same time, I kind of feel sorry for them because I'm like, this stuff isn't even realistic. It's not even real. I mean, it's not going to really help them to be a better person. It helps you to get excited for the game or whatever they're talking about, which is fine if that's what you're into. But to know that your sins, you know, to not even be conscious about your sins, the supernatural world, the fact that God is watching, he's giving us a limited amount of time before we die to do what we need to do down here for him so we can enter into his rest, uh, to know that this life that we are is temporary and the next life is going to be eternal and where you spend that life is all dependent upon what you're doing right now is really very, very, very important and imperative. And that is also why I've been prompted to share this series about the whole um, reading and analysis, 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 doing an analysis over the whole Bible. And um, also because of COVID-19, we have the extra time, so we might as well use this extra time wisely. We might as well use it very good. And there's no other better way. Yes, I know I, I have my video games and I have my other things that I'm reading and my other projects of music that I'm working on and, um, you know, doing other things that I like to do with my free time. But this definitely is one of the other things that I must do. And that's why I'm doing it, you guys. And I hope that you um, can appreciate that and understand where I'm coming from as a layman, as a Christian, as a person who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, as a person who um, has read the Bible many times and has been under many Bible study leaders, been in many Bible studies, been under good Sunday school classes. Um, uh, the church that I go to right now is live streaming. We, we do not have church because of the COVID-19 thing happening and that was mandated by law that were large gatherings are not supposed to meet. So of course we're following that. We're following the laws of the land. That is pleasing to God. That is the right thing that you need to do. But we also understand that the ecclesia, the, uh, the gathering together of the faithful, the gathering together of those who love the Lord is something that, um, you know, should not and technically, honestly, cannot be stopped because, you know, that's why we're doing live streams. And even now I'm uh, doing these videos because of that as well. So there's a lot of reasons why I'm doing these videos. But the main reason is for you, for the listener, for you, so you can get your heart right with Jesus Christ if you haven't already. And for those who are Christians already and, and need to listen to something wholesome and something true, which is the word, which is what I'm sharing. Um, I've talked about this before and uh, it's, it bears repeating again. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a prophet. I am a layman. I am a student of the Bible. I'm a, I'm a normal dude who's pretty much says, said a long time ago, oh Lord, there's something wrong with me. It's my sin. And that's every human being in, 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 the, in the world. We all have a sin problem. The, the thing is, we have to make up our mind whether we want Jesus to help us with that or we want to handle it on our own. <laughs> and there's nothing we can do to handle our own sin problem. That's why Jesus had to die and shed blood. So he shed the blood. So he's waiting for us, right, to go ahead and accept his blood covering by, by um, inviting him into our heart to come and live. And once we do that and acknowledge him as who the Bible says that he is, man, we've done it. We've got it. We've got the goods. And then there's awesome, so many other things that can follow that. But initially, that's the main thing we need to do so we can communicate with God, read the Bible and pray. And you and anybody who, who the Lord wants to do it can do exactly what I'm doing right now. It's not hard. You know, we need the word out there more. We have all these other things out there and all these other narratives and stories and things, which are great, but it can also cloud and be a distraction against what's real, against what's true, which is God, his word, his Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And that's another reason why I'm doing these videos. And, and also biblical illiteracy. People love to talk about the Bible. They love to speak against the Bible. They love to call the Bible out on things. They love to, to mock God's word. They love to, to mock the people of God. And, you know, I'm also doing this to 
for those folks so that they can see that this is a lot more realer uh, than what it's given credit for in some ways. I'm not trying to prove that the Lord is real. His proof is already in the earth. You can travel around the world and you can see for yourself. His proof is outside of the earth. Look at the other planets. Look at space. His proof is everywhere. And it's also with inside of each and every human being. He gives us that spark of life that keeps our heart beating, that gives us a, a spirit inside of us. Whether, I don't care what they want to say, we are three parts, mind, body, and spirit. Some people just say we're mind and, we're mind and body. So some people don't even acknowledge the spirit. Do you know what that means? That means they are one-third dead. They're not even spiritually alive. Yes, they're functioning in their mind, they're functioning in their body, but they give their spirit no time of the day. And that's very detrimental to one's overall health to ignore the spiritual health, which the Lord tells us how we should conduct our mind, how we should conduct our body, and how we should conduct our spirit. So every facet of life that we as human beings can operate it in is talked about in this Bible. So why would a person want to rob themselves of knowing the total truth of the matter? You know what I'm saying? It's demonic because the devil does not want us to be one with the Lord. He doesn't want us to do that because once we do that, we're going to start seeing things as they truly are, as they really are. So all the other nonsense and distractions that the devil and evil man can create won't even get in the way anymore once we have that. And we can also help other peoples to come to the truth of the light that is Jesus Christ. Why is Jesus Christ the light? Why is he in charge? Why does he rule everything? Because he's the only, he's the creator of, of it all. Not only that, he was the only one that could come down and bleed and die for our sins. Buddha didn't do that. Muhammad didn't do that. Okay? Hari Hari Krishna didn't do that. Vishnu didn't do that. Whoever you're talking about, whoever is a deity or a, like a deity, or which is usually going to be a lowercase g, God, which is basically could be translated into a demon. Because it's a lowercase g. It's not the God. The, the, the capital G-O-D. The Heavenly Father. The King of Kings. The Most High God. The CEO of the universe. Okay? The one who owns it all. The one who creates paradigms. There's a gentleman. I think his name is... Uh, I don't know if his name is Warren Buffett or if it's another type of gentleman. They talk about paradigm shifts. You know, the Lord is the creator of paradigms, and he is the shifter of them. And he can easily shift a paradigm out or in favor. He gives the promotion. The promotion comes from him. He gives more money. He gives more opportunities to make more money. He gives provision. He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You know what I'm saying? That's what that means. That's one of the things... Uh, and we're going to talk about that this morning as we do it. And I know that's probably a long introduction, but you guys know what I'm talking about by now. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. Genesis 22, New Living Translation. Abraham's faith is tested. See, so let, let's get into this thing. Let's do it. I'm excited. This is one of my favorite chapters, guys. Let's do it. So Genesis 22, New Living Translation, Abraham's faith is tested. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah, go, to sacrifice, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then... He chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with a donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. 
We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At the moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your own son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. Yep, Yahweh Jireh, basically Jehovah Jireh. um, On the mountain of the Lord, it it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and not and have not withheld even your own son, your only son. I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants will the nations of the earth be blessed all because you have obeyed me. This Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. Soon after this, Abraham heard of Milcah, his brother Nahor's wife, had borne Nahor eight sons. The oldest was named Uz. The next oldest was named Buz, followed by uh, Kemuel, the ancestor of the Aramines, Kased, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. In addition to these eight sons from Milcah, Nehor had four other children from his concubine Remua, uh, Riuma. Their names were Teba, Gehem, Tehash, and Maka. All right. That was an awesome chapter about why Abraham is the father of the faithful. So now we're going to read it again and do an analysis with it and get into the details of what the Holy Spirit was faithful to leave in this chronicle of Abraham, the father of the faithful. Without further ado, man, let's get on into it. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied. Here I am. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much and go to the land of Moriah. Okay, so let's pause here. God is basically testing Abraham's faith. So it's not enough to simply have faith. Okay? It's not enough to simply have faith. People say, I've got faith. I have faith. High apple pie in the sky, hopes. Like the song, right? It's not good enough to just have the faith. Your faith is going to be tested. So with that faith in the Lord, now you have to see... You have to see, uh, it basically is testing the faith that you say that you have or that the Lord knows that you have. Remember, uh, there's going to be a uh, verse later on we're going to read where the Lord never gives you anything that you couldn't handle on your own or that you couldn't handle. So the testings are not something that's extreme and you can't do it. You know what I'm saying? So this is awesome to see that Abraham is getting tested. And I know by this time, you know, it can be said that, yeah, you know, he's, he knows the Lord very well by now. He's advanced in years. He's not a young man. He's an old man, and he's even older now because his son has grown. He's not, his son is not a baby anymore. He's, the Bible calls him a youth or a boy. So uh, Isaac could be anywhere from um, his preteen years on the way, all the way to maybe uh, below. He could be 18. He could be 18 or less. He could be 17 or, 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 or younger right now. But, you know, he's old enough to where he can help his father out and carry the wood on his shoulders. So, you know, he's not a weak boy. And uh, so, yeah, he's probably anywhere from probably, 
I want to say 17, maybe 17 to 13, 17 to 12. He could be even 10 at this point. And he's already helping his father do manly stuff. That's awesome. This is an awesome image, too, of how men and their fathers should get together and do things. Um, man, it's really, really, really cool. I love this right here. But anyway, his faith is being tested. And um, it's funny how the Lord says, your only son, whom you love so much, take him. And uh, he wants him to go to the land of Moriah. Okay? So this is where we're at now. Let's continue. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire and a burnt offering, and he set out for the place that God had told him about. So without question, we see that Abraham is going to do this. You see, he didn't argue with God. You see, he didn't have a fit and say, God, how dare you ask me to kill my only son? You promised me this son. I finally have an heir, and now you want me to kill him? He could have said that, but Abraham didn't do that. He didn't even do that. He fully trusted God. He, he may have been already aware that this is a test from God to see his heart, to see what he's going to do. You know what I'm saying? He may have been aware of this. And so, whether he was aware or not, he obeyed God and did what he said and did not argue with him. Imagine if this would have happened today, what, what some people would have said to the Lord. Just imagine. Oh, you could think about it. But it's also funny how when the Lord was talking to him, take your son, your only son, the one whom you love so much, and go sacrifice him. Why do you think the Lord is asking Abraham to do such a thing? Remember, the things in the Old Testament are a type and shadow of things to come in the New Testament. This is clearly what God is going to do with his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, later for our sins in the New Testament. Later in the canonical biblical timeline, in the biblical history of the world, the history of the world, Jesus is going to die for our sins. So, it's so awesome that Abraham and God have this um, really good covenant relationship. Because God gave him a taste of what he is going to do with his son for all of us and our sins later on. So, this is incredible. This is an awesome type and shadow of things to come. And he's letting Abraham taste a little bit of this thing. So, let's go ahead and continue on here. <clears throat> on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there and we will come right back. See, Abraham is playing this cool. Even though... He's like, okay, well, I'm about to go offer my son to God, and I understand God can do anything. He's helped me so many times before in life. I have no reason to doubt God and what he can do. So I'm basically going to do what he's telling me, and I'm just going to do this and follow through with it because he's God, and he's protected me and my whole family this far. Why would he fail me now? I love my son, but I love the Lord more than my son. I love God and his, I love him, what he's telling me and what he's promising me more than my son. And if he's truthful about what he's saying about my descendants, which I know by now that he is, I have no reason to doubt him, then he'll bless me with another heir. He'll bless me with another son. Maybe sad that I have to start all over again, but, you know, God is God and he can do anything. And I'm sold on that and I'm going to believe him no matter what. So this is how Abraham is looking Adam, God has a track record, all right, with Abraham, and God can do anything but fail. God has a track record, even with you, if you're a Christian. Has God failed you? Has he let you down? Are you dead? Are you suffering right now? I mean, are you, you know, there have been hardships, but overall, God sees us through and he helps us. So let's continue on here. Abraham's faith is great right now, okay? 
So Abraham placed the wood and the burnt offerings on, on, a, on Isaac's shoulders while he carried himself carried the fire and a knife. And the two of them walked together. Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, uh, you know, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Now just imagine this. Some 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 fathers would already would already just fail God right here. You have your only son, the one whom you love so much. You know, God is faithful to, to emphasize that. The Holy Spirit is emphasizing that in here. And he is literally looking up at his father and asking in all honesty. Because he knows how this goes. He's seen Abraham do it many times before. It was the custom to do burnt offerings for the Lord for whether they be for sin, to give the Lord praise, it's just to give some time and energy and devote it to the Lord. You're not going to eat that animal. You're not going to serve it to your family to eat. It's totally an offering up to the Lord. Okay, before we, we did our cash offerings and, and, and before there was a currency, this is how they gave offerings and tithes to the Lord. Okay, it was a very, um, it, it was hard work. It was, yes, even bloody. Uh, but that's what the Lord asked. And it was an easy thing compared to other nations because you had the other demonic nations in the day. Like I said, they were into human sacrifice. They were into human sacrifice. And God is asking Abraham to sacrifice his own son. Now, Abraham also having a track worth, a record with God, we have to keep in mind that Abraham was never asked this before from God, ever. Ever. So, God asking for human sacrifice? This was a strange thing, because he's never done it before. But to Abraham, him having such great faith in the Lord, he didn't doubt it one bit. He just said, you know what? I'm going to do this because God said to do it. If God says to do it, you can take it and cash it all the way to the bank. Remember what I said in my other videos? That's true in this case. If God is telling you to do something, do it. Don't even hesitate. Some Somewhere says if God tells you to jump, you ask him how high. If God tells you to do something, do it. And Abraham has fully grasped that. There's a verse in the Bible that says, A faithful man, who can find? Who can find? People will proclaim their own righteousness. They'll talk about their own achievements and things in life. But a faithful man who is faithful and dedicated to the Lord, who can find this? This is not easy to find. If it was easy to find, everybody would be for the Lord. Everybody would talk about His goodness and His grace. Everybody would preach the good word. Everybody would do what um, God wants you to do and preach this gospel to the whole world. Gospel meaning the good news. Everybody would take this out everywhere. But not everybody does it. Not everybody is willing to do it. Not everybody can do it. Not everybody desires to do it. Not everybody even wants to do it. People don't even like to think of doing missionary work and doing these things and following the Lord. And there is a reality to why that is. I mean, not everybody can be preachers. Not everybody can go out and, and go to a foreign land and be in that work and learn a language if they need to or, or uh, you know, have an inter find somebody there who can interpret or go through all the work of the technicalities of establishing a church in a place that there are none or very little churches in. You know what I mean? Not everybody is called to that work. You got to have some people send and support them off. And that's why you got people like me and people, other people in the world who work, make their, you know, living the natural, uh, the, um, or make their living, the, you know, the, the good old working way. You make it and you give what, you know, the Lord asks. Tithe, 10% of the income. And if everybody did that in the world, I, the, there would be no lack. The problem is not everybody does it. So this is why we have a lot of lack in the world. Just imagine if everybody gave 10% of their income. Everybody. Everybody in the world. Owners of big, huge companies. Bosses, CEOs of other types of things. Just imagine that. Anyway. 
So a lot of fathers would have failed here. They have their own son looking them up in their eyes. Asking them, where's the offering, Dad? I know the wood and the fire, and I've seen you do this countless times, but you usually have an animal that you want to offer up. Where's that at? And Abraham replies to them, the Lord's going to provide that, son. The Lord's going to provide that. I can imagine what Abraham might be feeling right now. But he's ignoring those weird emotions and feelings. He is doing the manliest thing a man could ever do. Ignore his emotions. To be all up in your emotions, you're, you're womanly. You're, 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 you're very female at that point. And Abraham is a man's man. He's a manly man. He's not a feminine man. He's not an effeminate man. He's not a uh, girly man, in other words. He is a manly man, and he's ignoring all these emotions and simply doing what the Lord told him to do, because that is his God. And this is why God establishes the order in creation. It's God, man, and then woman. Okay, and then children, and then, then animals, if you wanted to get technical. But God, man, and woman. God talks to the man, man does things, and then, of course, the man will talk to the woman, and then the woman does what she needs to do to facilitate everything in the household and to make sure everything is good and orderly in the man's realm. And then, But even the man has to get away from that and go spend time with God to hear from God. Why? Because God is going to speak to the man first. Okay? God is going to speak to the man first because the man is going to have to make some critical decisions and do some things that women just wouldn't be able to do. <laughs> they would, a woman wouldn't be able to kill her own son. It's not even in the nature of a woman to do such a thing. She nurtures and bears and takes care of. You know how God didn't talk to Sarah and then Sarah didn't tell Abraham to do this. God spoke to Abraham. That's why it's really important that men are in tune with the Bible. Men are in tune with God in their home. As the, as the leader of the home, you really, really got to be in tune with God. That's why whenever I see these, you know, men who, you know, their wives are leading the congregation and the man just kind of helps out and follows what she says, that's very strange. I don't know how the man, I don't know how the man could do that. I don't know how the man, his manliness inside of him would allow that to happen. God has created an order. God, man, woman. If, you, if anything is out of that order, it's out of order. And God it has, takes no pleasure or part in that. Anyway, I know I'm talking about other things right now. And we'll get into more of those things in my later videos. But right now, we're going to uh, focus on this. I'm just making that connection, seeing how it's all connecting in this analysis, this deep analysis of this word. And this may not be all that deep. I know there might be others who can get in deeper. But these are just truths that we need to embrace as men and women. That there, there is no female and male in Christ, but God has special roles for us that we have to do in order to make things work easy and make things work nice for one another. You know? So a woman wouldn't be able to do this. I know this is hard for Abraham. But a woman wouldn't be able to even follow through with this. Number one, it's a lot of physical work involved. They had to go trek. They had to go to a mountain. They had to get way far away from Abraham's place. They had to get firewood. They had to do all these things, you know. And it's like, it's just, it's just crazy, right? A woman wouldn't even think of a million years of doing some stuff like this. So whenever you get them women talking about I can do anything a man can do, even better, well, okay, tell them about this. See, see how they handle this, you know. It's no woman could do this, which is why God didn't speak to Sarah. He spoke to Abraham, and which is why men need to be in tune with, their, with the Lord God, Jesus Christ, their creator. They must be because that's when you're going to have good direction and you're going to know what you need to be doing in life. I mean, some things God leaves you to figure out on your own, right? But then there's other things that when you have God on your side, it's just an easier choice. And it gives you clear direction on what to do. So you're not hemming and hawing and wondering and uh, wishy-washy and not sure what to do. And it takes you many, many years of life wasted because you didn't have clear-cut vision and direction. Well, with the Lord at the helm, some things are just easier. A lot of things are just easier with God there. And that, that's what I'm getting into right now. Okay, so let's continue on here. 
So God will provide the sheep for the burnt offering, my son Abraham answered, and they both walked together. When they arrived at the place where God had told uh, him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him to the altar on the top of the wood. So Abraham, Abraham is already ready to tie Isaac to it. And as we can see here, Isaac didn't even fight. Isaac didn't even fight back. He just fully trusted his dad as Abraham is trusting his spiritual father. I mean, it's just awesome what's happening right here. Nobody's questioning anything. And if there was questions, the Bible didn't, didn't, uh, it didn't uh, show that. But I don't think there was anything. I think Abraham was well set on obeying the Lord. And the Bible's clear to show that. Isaac was tied up on the altar and he, he tied up. If Isaac has seen his father do these offerings before, he, well, we already know Isaac knows about these things because he's seen Abraham do it before and probably other servants. And he knows that he's being tied up on the altar. So he's like, okay, and I guess I'm going to be a burnt offering for the Lord if that's what he told you to do, Dad. You, you do what the Lord told you to do. You know what I mean? And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At the moment, the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And yes, Abraham replied, here I am. I bet you Abraham right here was like, yes, Lord, please, t please tell me what you want me to do next. I'm hoping that you, you know, want me not to follow through with this. You know what I'm saying? I can hear it in Abraham's voice right now. I can, I mean, you can, you can read this, man. You can feel this. Come on, dude. Oh my God. Put down those other novels. Put down these other writings. Read this Bible. You'll be surprised at how down to earth and how um, relatable this Bible is. Yes, even still in these times. Oh my goodness. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not turn him, do not hurt him in any way, for now I know you that you truly fear God. You have not even withheld from me even your own son. That that's something. So this this is the this is an angel of the Lord. See, in the original King James Version, it's, there's some parts where it says the angel of the Lord and the angel is in caps. This is the New Living Translation, so I don't know if... Reading, reading it, I don't know if this is the pre-incarnate Christ, but it sounds like it is because he says, you know, this is an angel of the Lord, right? Well, at the moment, the angel of the Lord called him. So... Yeah, that's, that's probably the pre-incarnate pre Christ. He basically came down to stop him. And of course, he's getting directives from God to do this. So Jesus isn't doing this on his own accord. You have God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, right? Working together as one now. Keep that in mind. So whenever Jesus or God, whenever God wants to do something, I mean, he needs nobody's permission, but whenever Jesus Christ does something, or the pre-incarnate Christ, or an angel of the Lord, is it? It's a directive, an order straight from God to go out down and execute. So, yeah, this is. He even says, "You have not withheld from me even your own son." So that's God talking through Jesus Christ, straight up. He says, "You haven't even withheld from me." Who is this? This is God, because God is the one who told him to do this in the first place, right? So this is the pre-incarnate Christ coming down to intervene and share the awesome news about you do not have to kill your son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in its horns in a thicket, and he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh. It says here Yahweh Jireh, but, you know, Yahweh, Jehovah, it basically means God. And then that other thing means what is God about and God is basically translated translates out God God provides Jehovah Jireh which means the Lord will provide right to this day people still use that name as a proverb and they're right Jehovah Jireh my provider then there's other names that he has Jehovah Nisi the banner 
And that comes from when um, somebody in the Bible, I don't know, I think it was Moses. Or it was someone who had to lift their hands. It was Joshua. I forget. We're going to read that in the future, so don't worry. We're going to get into it. They had to lift their hands up like they're lifting up a sign. And that basically is a sign that we have the victory. But the moment your hands go down and get tired and you cannot lift them anymore, you don't have the victory anymore. And the, they were losing the battle. So he had to have somebody come and help him to keep his hands lifted to raise them up to God so they could win the battle. And that was God showing everybody that it's because of me, me helping you guys that you're winning this battle. Do not ever think it's because of your, your own strength. Don't get in prideful and say, oh, we did this ourselves. That's the whole reason God did that to them. Anyways, that's going to be later though. But we're seeing all the connections stemming from Abraham simply following the Lord and doing what he was told to do right now. People don't realize if you follow the Lord, you, man, you're doing such a great service for yourself and your posterity and your future offspring to come. The angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your own son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of, enemies, of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. Then they returned the, to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba where Abraham continued to live. So the Lord is letting him know and assuring him of the promise again. Not only that, but we know this is a type and shadow of the things to come where God is going to eventually tell Jesus Christ, you know, to do what he needs to do, which is God's word personified. So Jesus is God then, just another extension of him. One that can function in the earthly realm without destroying it. This is why a lot of people, when they say, Oh, how come God didn't come down and die himself? What kind of stupid f person sends his own son? I've heard people say that. They totally don't understand the concept of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. They don't understand the truth. It's not a concept. The truth of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? If God were to come down the earth, the Spirit of God, God's own Spirit, God who is omnipotent, omnipresent, who's all those things. If he were to come down to earth, earth would be destroyed. It would just be like the sun coming to earth. The sun has to be a certain bit away so that earth doesn't get destroyed. Okay? Just like how, you know, I mean, if God, I mean, the world couldn't handle the weight of God in his presence coming to earth. That's why Jesus has to create a new heaven and a new earth to where things will work and where things will work to where God can freely come up and down and do all that stuff. But if he were to come down now, I mean, he would totally destroy the earth. So that's why God sends, you know, Jesus mentioned the Holy Spirit. The whole, now the Holy Spirit is who comes and who visits us during church services and worship services at, at times where the Holy Spirit's spirit is welcome by we creating an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit to come. That's why they praise and worship. That's why we pray. And that's why we read the Bible. And that's why we ask God, please, we need your Holy Spirit to come down and help us during this time. You know, before I do these videos, I'm, I pray and ask God to help me because I need to have the mind of Christ and I need his help to be able to articulate and rightly describe and let folks know what this word is saying you know what I'm saying and you know the Holy Spirit will come down in the middle of me talking this and he will touch people and he will touch me and he will help us to where we have better clarity and we can be in agreement about this word that we're talking about in it and the Holy Spirit does another number of things that we, that are behind the scenes that we can't even begin to explain, <laughs> okay? Like I said, I said it in the other videos, the Holy Spirit can do for us in a few seconds what we can't even do for ourselves in a lifetime. Just picture that. Try to grasp that. And so, 
because he obeyed him, you know, he's going to give him a lot of descendants. And we already know that those descendants are us, people who love the Lord, people who are Christian, people who have accepted Jesus Christ's blood covering. We are seeds of Abraham. And there'd be many other people out there who are seeds of Abraham too. Hebrews gets into that. And we're going to be reading Hebrews way later in the future when we go inside the New Testament. But let's get back to this video now. So soon after this, Abraham heard that Milcah, his brother Nahor's uh, wife, had born Nabor eight sons. The oldest son's name was Uz, and the next oldest son was Booz, followed by Kenuel and the ancestor of the Aramines. Kased, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. In addition to uh, these eight sons from Milcah, Nahor had four other children from his concubine, Riuma. Their names were Teba, Gehem, Tehash, and Maka. I think God put that in there. The Holy Spirit was faithful to put that in there just so Abraham doesn't get all the, uh, the light and the glory for doing what he did. Uh, they kind of wanted to talk about something else in that, in that verse just to kind of uh, shed some light on another family who was probably, um, you know, probably um, close to the Lord and maybe followed the Lord as well and did right in the sight of the Lord. And so he wanted to show their children and their offspring and how they were being fruitful and they were multiplying wonderfully, just like God asked them to do, right? Just like God commanded them to do, actually. So, yeah, that was basically one of my favorite chapters, and it shows why Abraham has the title, title the father of the faithful. And um, it's really awesome to see that. I, I love this chapter. I don't know about you guys, but I really love that. It just goes to show you trust God even when things don't even look right. Even when things are kind of strange. Trust the Lord anyways. It's more than likely just a test. And whatever the Lord says, no matter how harsh it sounds, do it. Because we have an enemy who hates us and want to kill us and is probably going to tell us to do all manner of other things, whether it's less harsh or more harsh, as long as it's against God. The devil is satisfied with us being against God. Anyway, I know my introduction to this video was kind of long and I feel that I um, talked about this quite a bit. I'm not sure what my time is right now. I see it. We're going on 50 minutes. So without further ado, we're going to move into the prayer phase. Prayer for sinners to come to Jesus Christ to repent. Prayer for the backsliders to come back home. That's what we're going to dedicate this for right now. Backsliders, you know who you are. But first and foremost, it's your first time listening to something like this. You would agree with me. You'll say, John Mark, bro, they're not going to talk about what you're talking about in any type of class or college setting or any scholarly place. Even though the Bible is a scholarly writing and is used multiple times, and I've even used it in my assignments for my college classes, it is a scholarly writing and it has all kinds of useful information in there. Like I said, scientific facts are in the Bible. The 10 scientific facts from the Bible, there are more than 10, but the 10 that they just wanted to harp on uh, Ray Comfort does a very good job. You can see that video on YouTube. The, sin, uh, the, the 10 scientific facts from the Bible. Ray Comfort does an awesome job going to people in universities and campuses, talking to normal people out on the street about these things, and he videotapes it, and he shows it. And there is proof and evidence all throughout the Bible that people are still finding today. So those people that says the Bible is hogwash or it doesn't make any sense... Oh my goodness, you, they, they must not read it. And they are biblically illiterate. They don't have the, the spiritual capacity to understand it. Because the Bible is more than just mind and it's more than just body. It's body, it's action, yes. It's more than just cerebral. It's more than just a mind. Your spirit has to be in tune with the Lord and you have to be following Him with your heart. You have to invite him in your heart, and that's what I'm inviting you guys to do right now. You say, John Mark, I don't know all that you're talking about, but I know my heart needs to get right with God. I want to pray with you right now. You see, you're a sinner. You don't know who Jesus Christ is. You never thought about him. Um, you may not even do anything that evil, or maybe you have thoughts of doing things evil, or you just never given your life to Jesus Christ before. And if you were to die right now, you're not even sure where you'd go. That's you. That's who I'm speaking to. And I speak of people for who want to get their hearts right with Jesus Christ. 
You're not even really sure what's after death. You have no clue. The Bible says it's appointed for man to die once, and then the judgment. Okay? But without Jesus Christ, I mean, you know, you'll be dying twice. And you'll only live once. But with Jesus Christ, you'll live twice. And you only have to die once. That is so awesome how that equates out. And you want to be invited and the Lord is calling you and he's tugging on your heartstrings. You're feeling something right now. You don't know what that is. That's the Lord tugging at you. You say, yes, I want to get my heart right with Jesus. And you'll, you'll bow your head and close your eyes and respect to God and everyone around you. If there are people around you right now, and you'll repeat after me. You'll say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. And I'm asking that you come inside of my heart. Take away all of my sin. Make me clean right now by your precious blood. And I'll serve you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for that. Backsliders, changing the order of this altar call, changing the order of this prayer right now. Backsliders, those who have, you say you once followed the Lord, but you stepped away for whatever reason. You said, ah, that's not for me. Or maybe you said, ah, those people hurt my feelings in church. Or maybe somebody made you mad inside the house of God. Maybe it was something to do with leadership. Maybe it was something to do with a fellow brother or sister in church. You, they, they did something to you, and it just was uncalled for what they did to you. Well, you're going to have to forgive them of that. Now, I can't tell you where to go to church. I'm not forcing you where to go to church, but you need to get things right with that person, or you get, need to get things right with that congregation first. If you want to go somewhere else, you can go somewhere else to church. That's fine. But... You know, you need to get things right with whoever made you leave or whatever caused you to get separate from that. You know what I'm saying? And you have to get things right. You have to forgive people. Because if you don't forgive them, the Lord's not going to forgive or heal you. So it's very important that you do that. So if you're trying to get that thing right, get it right right now. Get it right right now. Come back to the Lord. Come back to the Lord. So now we're going to change the order of the service. We're going to go over to... Um, those who need healing for prayer. You've, you've got COVID-19. You've contracted it. You know you got it. All the tests are saying that you got it. You're feeling like you got it. Maybe you didn't take a test. You just feel. You know you got it. But you don't want to go to the hospital because you, you're scared to death that they're gonna, you're probably going to die in the hospital if you go there. Plus, you don't want all the bills that come along with that. I totally understand that. The bill part, definitely. There's some people, you're just trying to take care of what you can take care of now. You're not trying to add anything to all those bills. Well, let me tell you something right now. God is here for you right now, and he can heal that. He can heal anything from a hangnail to AIDS. God is not a practicing physician. He is the physician. Okay? And he can help you. This is where I need everybody who I just prayed for and all those Christian listeners all around the world to believe collectively with me right now. We need our collective faith to work together. This is where it's just more than one person's faith. It's more than just a few people's faith. It's everybody gathered together under the name of Jesus Christ, the sound of my voice right now. And we're going to pray for those people who are sick. There's some people you aren't sick. You're feeling as fit as a fiddle. But you want to stand in for somebody who is desperately ill or who is clinging on to life. This right here is for you. This right here, you can do that here too. There is no time and distance with prayer. We as human beings are separated by time and distance. God, the Holy Spirit, is not separated by such things. Even Jesus, when he was down on earth, he said, you know, I, that's what separates me from all the rest of the world, which is why I got to go back up to my throne. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit down who isn't limited by those things. Okay? So... Hey, come on. This is what we need to do. Let's pray right now. Let's all believe together at the same time. Pray in tongues if you know, if you can speak in tongues. Pray in your normal voice. Pray in your native tongue. Pray in whatever way that you can pray to the Lord and you sincerely mean it with me. Let's do it right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you right now. We come in the name of Jesus by your precious blood that everyone all over the world, whatever is ailing them, whatever hurts them, Heavenly Father, whatever is inside of them, any abnormality, whether it be a fungus, bacteria, AIDS, 
a hangnail, pain, headaches, stomach flu problems, flu problems, symptoms, the COVID-19, whatever it is, touch them and heal them right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, by your precious blood, we pray. Oh God, you can do all things and we can do all things through you. You said this. You matter of fact, you even saying your word, even greater things than you will be able to do. And you did some awesome things while you were serving people on this earth when you came to be our sacrifice. And we thank you, Lord God, that, that we can do this, that we can believe in your name. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it's done right now. We give you the praise and the adoration that it is done right now. Oh, Lord God, in Jesus' name, we thank you that it's done. Amen. You guys test yourself now. This is more than just a prayer. This requires action. Test yourself. Uh, test yourself. If you've been healed, let me know in the comments below. Please let me know. I got to know that this thing is working and that God is doing what, you know, his word says that we could do. We're able to do this. I know I have the faith, but I need you guys to help increase the faith. Let me know what's going on. Tell somebody else that you, um, around in your vincity what God has done for you. Let them know that he's alive and he's ready to help them too and whatever they would need. For those people who have deep um, concerns, like it's something that you cannot right away tell that it's been healed, like a cancer, uh, a cyst, uh, maybe it's a tumor somewhere, deep things that are inside your body, you're going to have to go get a doctor, you're going to have to go to the doctor, he's going to have to run a test to see if it's gone, okay? So be sure you go out and do that. But if you already know that you're healed, hallelujah, let somebody know. Please let me know in the comments, please. And um, for those who uh, don't feel a change, but you know you prayed and you know you've prayed the prayer of repentance and you know if you're a backslider, you've gotten your heart right with Jesus Christ right now and you prayed with me and you don't feel any change, then like I said, you may have to go forgive some people. There's, if there's somebody that comes to mind that makes you mad and it makes you clench your fist and it makes you want to, well, I don't know, punch a punching bag extra harder or uh Beat up your pillow at night, uh, somebody that makes you cry, somebody that you're going to have to go forgive that person for what they did to you. And then you're going to feel the healing. God heals instantaneously and some it takes longer. Some people you got to go home. You're going to have to get rid of those drugs. You're going to have to get rid of that alcohol. You're going to have to get rid of that cigarettes. You're going to have to get rid of the vice that's getting you addicted. If it, addiction is what you're going through. Everybody's story is different, but everybody's story is true with the Lord. That's called a testimony. And the Lord is creating you a testimony right now. But you got to do the right thing with this thing. So not only does it take the faith to believe, it takes action. So I want you guys to respond and leave me comments, please. This is all glory goes to the Lord. It, all glory doesn't go to John Mark. Okay. Like I said, I'm not getting paid for this. Nobody's paying me for this. Um, I, you know, I don't even want to show my face <laughs> because... I just want to have all praise and glory goes to the Lord. I lend my voice in service to the Lord, and I'm so thrilled at what God is doing all around the world, despite these restrictions that we have placed on us. Despite these restrictions that we have placed on us. I thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you so much, and until our next video, I will see you again, or uh, you'll hear me again, and uh, hopefully I see you in the form of your comments. That really means the world to me. That's all I have to really let me know that this thing is working and it's really helping people. Thank you very much. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you.